In Topeka, Kansas, Linda Brown was not able to attend the same school as her white peers. And because of that, her parents were concerned. In the United States of America in 1951, there was a practice that was known as separate but equal. There were two different schools, one school for whites and one school for blacks. And the thought was that even though these schools are separate, they are equal. But Linda's parents were concerned that because of this environment, she would not be confident in herself. She would not have the same level of education as her white peers. So Linda Brown and her parents ended up bringing a lawsuit against the Department of Education in Topeka, Kansas. This landmark lawsuit was known as Brown versus Board of Education. And it was because of this lawsuit that schools were desegregated. It was because of Linda Brown and her parents. Now, when her parents brought this lawsuit to the Supreme Court, they had to prove. They had to prove that even by being separate, these children, this third grader, was somehow being hurt because of it. And so they turned to research related to psychology. There were two researchers from Columbia University, Kenneth and Mamie Clark. And in 1947, they conducted a, a study known as the Doll Test, in which they worked with five to nine-year-old black boys and girls and presented them with two dolls, a black one and a white one. And these researchers asked these five to nine-year-old questions, questions like, oh, little boy or girl, which doll is good? Which doll is evil? Which doll is beautiful? Which doll is ugly? Which doll do you want to play with? 70% of the young black boys and girls would pick up the black doll and they'd say, this is the doll that's ugly. This is the doll that's evil. This is the doll that I don't want to play with. And they'd pick up the white doll and they'd say, this is the doll that's good. This is the doll that I want to play with. And what was worse was at the end, the researchers asked a question and they said, young boy or girl, which doll looks like you? And these children would pick up the black doll, the one that they said was evil, and the one that they said they didn't want to play with, and they'd pick that one up, and they said, this is the doll that looks like me. Now, these researchers discovered something incredible. That is, in an environment steeped with discrimination, the issue wasn't how the rest of the world looked at the black community, but instead how young black boys and girls began to look at themselves. They discovered something called internalized oppression. Now, in 2016, our team with NeuroKids replicated the study. But instead of looking at racial identity, we looked at religious identity. Together with Dr. David Hempel, the Dean of the College of Education at San Francisco State University, we worked with five to nine-year-old Muslim children in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our study had two parts. The first part was an in-depth interview, and the second part was a performance task. And you can't see the picture very well because of the lighting, but believe me when I tell you, on the left-hand side, there's a picture of a woman who's not wearing hijab, and on the right side, there's a picture of a woman who wears hijab. And we, in turn, ask these children questions. Questions like, which is pretty? Which has a lot of friends? Which one belongs in her community? Uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the results were fascinating. However, they were limited because this was only in the San Francisco Bay Area. So this year, between 2017 and 2018, we've been in the process of replicating this study. But not just in San Francisco, across five major cities in the US and Canada. In the Los Angeles uh, area, in the Phoenix area, in the, DC, uh, in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, in Atlanta, and in Dallas, Texas. Now, we're still in the process of finishing up this research. To date, we've sampled about 355 to nine-year-old Muslim children, the majority of whom were born and raised in the United States of America. They're ethnically diverse. However, we are under-indexed on black boys and girls within the Muslim community. This is something that we're working on currently. Uh, and among the sample, half went to full-time Islamic school and half went to full-time public school. Inshallah, today I'm going to share with you some of the high-level results. This study is still ongoing. We envision it will be complete in September 2018, at which point it will be available for download. And if you're interested, we can chat about that later. So let me share with you a couple of the top-level findings. We discovered that one in three Muslim children responded that they do not want others to know that they are Muslim. 
15% of Muslim children responded that sometimes I pretend not to be Muslim. Now, Amina, a five-year-old, summarized this best. She said, they, the kids in public school, they don't know that I'm Muslim. And I don't want them to know. Now, this is internalized oppression. This is this idea that um, Amina and the one, to three, uh, one in three other children between this age group communicated that they didn't want others to know that they're Muslim. What that means is that between five to nine years old, these children are already aware of the negative way in which they're perceived by others, so much so that they do not want others to know about their Muslim identity. A second key observation relates to this. Being conflicted about being both Muslim and American. One in two Muslim children responded that they do not know whether they can be both Muslim and American. And this is summarized best by Serena, who's nine. She says, some Americans, like, they don't like Muslims. And they say, oh, you can't eat here. You, you can't do things because you're not American. You're a Muslim, and, and you're a terrorist. They, they say that maybe. Now, when we hear something like this, what this implicitly shows is this child is feeling conflicted about being both Muslim and American. Now, when we look at all of these results, there are a couple of key takeaways, especially given the fact that I only have 20 minutes, that I want to share with you with respect to this. The first relates to age. These are five to nine-year-old Muslim boys and girls. Why does that matter? According to child psychology, by the time a child is eight years old, a significant part of their identity has been established. When I was at Berkeley, there was a researcher who asked a very provocative question. She said, what was the purpose of childhood? Childhood is defined as this period of time within which an individual is actually not contributing much value. They're actually, uh, they are needing other people to take care of them. Normally, that period of childhood is about seven or eight years. However, if you ask my wife, she'd probably say it's closer to 30 years. Because I'm 30 years old, and that was a joke. So it's during this period of time that a child's brain is developing. Now a parent will ask themselves, and they'll think, you know what, I want my child to have the most cognitive functionality that they possibly can. I want them to have the biggest brain. How can I ensure that my child has that? Or it turns out it's through play, and the reason why is uh, play is the child form of experimentation, and as children experiment, they learn about the world. They'll go to like a light switch, they'll flick it, they say, oh, the light goes on, oh, they flick it, oh, the light goes off. But regardless, these first eight years matter a great deal. And if these children are feeling this way about being Muslim at five, six, seven, and eight years old, what will this child feel when he or she is 15 or 16? And this point can't be understated because of the context within which these five to nine-year-old children are coming of age today. At a point in time when their president and leader is openly unaccepting of who they are. So this is one of the first things that we think about is if five to nine-year-olds are responding in this way, we're not worried about a five to nine-year-old having an identity crisis. We're worried that if this child solidifies their identity and this is what they believe at this age, when this child is now 15, 16, 17, 18, will that ch child know what it means to be a Muslim in America? Will that child be proud of who he or she is? The second key piece is this question. Do these children feel like they belong? When one in three Muslim children say that sometimes I pretend or I don't want others to know that I'm Muslim. When one in two feel conflicted about being both Muslim and American. When 15% say that sometimes I pretend not to be Muslim, the single biggest thing we take away is this, this question of belonging. Do these kids feel like they belong? Now, a parent will ask, who cares? If a child doesn't feel like they belong, so what? Why does it matter if a child feels like they belong? The first thing I'll say is it's about agency. So if I said right now that there is a Tesla that has its lights on outside, anyone who owns a Tesla will like reach for their keys and they'll get up and they'll look for their car because they think that perhaps it belongs to them. If you don't own a Tesla, 
If you own a Nissan like me, you'd be like, ah, someone else will worry about it. That doesn't belong to me. Belonging is related to agency. If something belongs to you, you then care about it. If a child feels like they belong within their American context, what that then infers is the child has agency over that context. If that child feels like they belong in their American context, that means that they are now caring or concerning or enabled to be responsible for that. Does that make sense? Belonging is related to agency. If our kids don't feel like they belong, there's a concern on whether they will have agency over their environment. This is a big deal. By the way, I would ask parents to sort of think to themselves, do you feel like you belong? And if so, or if not, are you involved in your local community or your local government? Do you have agency around your environment? Because if we ourselves don't feel like belong, like we belong, we may not actually have agency over our environment as well. The second has to do with assimilation and resistance. So, in the face of discrimination and in the face of this challenge, we know in analyzing other communities that the reality is there's very little research that exists on the Muslim community. This Muslim identity study that we're sharing with you today is, in, in, in from what we understand and what we've observed, one of the most robust studies of child psychology within the Muslim community today. There's not a lot of research on the Muslim community, but there is a great deal of research on the black community and the Latino community and the Jewish community. One of the things we know from the black community is in the 1970s, in the face of an, of an environment that demonstrated a lack of belonging, there are two extreme responses. One is assimilation, that is of trying to fit in as much as possible with your peers. So, and the second is that of resistance. That is of digging your heels in the ground and feeling like, you know what? If these people don't accept us, then we're going to make them accept us, or we're going to resist this as much as possible. When we think about the Muslim community, to assimilate would be the idea of trying to fit in as much as possible and perhaps losing some of the hallmarks of your Muslim identity. If my name is Muhammad, perhaps I start going by Mo. If I am uh, a man, perhaps I you know, don't uh, you know, practice uh, you know, the hijab of a beard, for example. And perhaps you can each think to yourselves, do you know of someone in your social circle, in your community, who perhaps, as a result of this, may have attempted to assimilate or continues to? The second is that of resistance. Within the black community, the analogy we think of is the Black Panthers. That is, in the face of this type of discrimination, actively resisting. Now, I'll tell you, I, in the past, did not look at resistance as a significant threat within the Muslim community. Because the analog for us would be extremism. And I didn't think it was a big deal, and I don't want to come here and say, oh, this is a huge issue, and, and that's not my platform at all, but I do want you to understand that this is actually a challenge. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I'm from, a 15-year-old boy, Abdur Razak Warsa, 15 years old, him and eight other boys, born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, at 15 years old, fell just a year, two years ago in 2016, during the midst of this presidency, felt like, you know what? Our country is not accepting of us. And him and these eight other boys booked a one-way ticket to Syria, and before they did, they ended up getting handcuffed by the FBI. And that's not the only situation. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to go to Phoenix. Phoenix was one of the cities where we went to. In Phoenix, there was a 15-year-old Pakistani boy who plays basketball at his local masjid, a part of his weekend Islamic school. And when there was a situation where people were depicting the Holy Prophet in a negative way, this 15-year-old had enough. He ended up taking a gun and taking it to this convention, and before anything could happen, he got arrested for it. Now again, I don't want to overplay this, but I do want you to understand that if this lack of belonging exists within kids, these are two of the responses that we know empirically can result. And a third relates to an inferiority complex. So first thing I talked about was agency, this idea of feeling if you belong, you care about the environment. The second had to do with assimilation versus resistance. And the third is an inferiority complex. We know that there is uh, something called stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is the idea of when an individual feels as though they are being stereotyped against, 
They then respond, and because they're aware of this, it influences their behavior. So an example of this is, I travel, mashallah, enough, and when I go through security every time, I know I have nothing to worry about, but I know to some degree, I'm being stereotyped again sometimes because of my beard. I've got these little Muslim children's books. And every time I go through that security line, I'm like, oh man, I hope I didn't do something wrong. You know, it influences my behavior. Because I know that I am being stereotyped against, it influences my behavior. And this can also be termed as an inferiority complex. And if a child doesn't feel like they belong in their environment, this too can be a issue. The question is this. And when we talk to communities, oftentimes a question arises and they say, do we want to belong as Americans? Like, do we want to belong in this country? I mean, perhaps there's issues with our foreign policy and things like that that I don't agree with. And this was actually observed in the data. We found with statistical significance that Arab children had less favorable attitudes towards America, Americans, and being American. Should be being American, not being America. No child is the country. That was a joke as well. That's okay. You don't have to laugh. So the question is why, right? Like, why is this the case? And by the way, I see the Pakistani people in the audience are like, yeah, that's true. And the Arab people are like, no, that's not true. No, I'm kidding. But the question is, why did we observe this? During the interviews, the reason why this was observed is children who are Arab would say, well, I don't know if I can be American or I don't know if I enjoy being American because America, well, they're at war with my country. If that child is Lebanese, for example, or if that child is from Yemen or if that child is from Iraq, that child may feel like, you know what, there is some issue with respect to American foreign policy and as it relates to the Muslim world. And this, by the way, is a reality. So how do we build congruency from the idea of number one, being American and number two, perhaps being at odds or feeling different ways about uh, about uh, being uh, American or American foreign policy. One of the things I recognize is this. Oftentimes with respect to identity, we think you can be either Muslim or you can be American, or you can be Pakistani, or you can be Minnesotan. But that's actually not the way identity works. We can be all of the above. We can be Muslim and we can be Pakistani and we can be American, and we can be a Minnesota Vikings fan, and we can be a lover of lasagna, and we can be a marathon runner, and we can be so many things, right? So identity is not mutually exclusive. Oftentimes in our mind, especially perhaps we might be Pakistani, we might be Egyptian or something that's a fact, and we say, you know, I want my child to hold on to that culture. They can hold on to that culture and still be American at the same time. It need not be mutually exclusive. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be a little bit fast. The question is, um, how do we solve this problem? How do we actually build the sense of belonging? And there's a host that we can talk about. I'm gonna share one element with you today that we observed in the data. And that is this. Children whose mothers wear hijab demonstrated more confidence in their identity than those who, whose mothers do not wear hijab. And this was found with statistical significance. We can say with a 90% confidence level that this is what we observed in the data. Now what does this mean? This does not mean that our problem will be solved if every mother, every mom wears hijab. No, 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 that's not what this means. What this means is that parent behavior, parent actions are actually inextricably linked to children's behavior. Now hijab is just one decision that a mother or father can decide on. Think about the hundreds of decisions that a parent makes every single day. Do we have a relationship with the masjid? Do we go to Juma when there's an opportunity to? Do we attend weekend Islamic school? Are we involved whenever we can? Do we recite Quran at home? Do we perform Salat al Jamaah at home? There are so many actions that a mom or a dad does every single day. Hijab is just one of them that we're able to very easily observe in the data. Just to reiterate, this finding tells us one extraordinarily important thing, and that is parents play an incredible role in how a child thinks about themselves. Now, I'll share one story with you from my own life. Now, when I was a kid, we used to take road trips everywhere because as I may have mentioned, I'm Pakistani, and so we try to save money as much as we can. <laughs> Um, and the Arab people were like, no, we do too. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, so, so we used to take road trips, and when we would go, and we'd stop at the rest area, and it was time to perform salah, before we'd perform salah, my dad would like look to the left, and he'd look to the right, 
and he'd make sure that like nobody was watching. And when no one was watching, that's when we would perform our salah. And by the way, I say that I love my dad. May Allah bless my dad. And it's not a means to demean him. It's to share a personal story instead of someone else's, right? This one small action that my dad did when I was a young child taught me a lesson that somehow by performing salah, I was doing something weird. I was doing something awkward. This is something that I should perhaps be a little bit ashamed of. This is what I mean when I say parent decisions matter a great deal. And I'll tell you this, I won't share this story just in the interest of time, but I will say this. In research that was done in the US, replicated in Europe, replicated in Southeast Asia, and replicated in Africa, the single most important variable that impacts a child's understanding of who they are it is the quality of the relationship they have with their mother and father. The Muslim community, no doubt, is experiencing intense challenges today. And by the way, we follow a legacy of other folks, including the Jewish, the Latino, and the black community that still face intense challenges today. And there's no doubt that we too will overcome. However, my theory, our theory of change, is that this begins at home. Now, before I conclude, I, I want to share two quick things with you. Number one is this. Uh, I shared just a little bit about our research today. There's other things, for example, the role of weekend Islamic school and full-time Islamic school. If you're interested in learning more, we also offer teacher workshops and parent workshops at various communities. Please feel free to check us out. Um, we have a booth downstairs. The other thing I'll share is a little bit about Noor Kids. The organization that I represent, I'm the managing director of, Noor Kids is an organization that started at Harvard about five years ago. Our goal is to figure out how can we ensure kids develop an intense, genuine love for Islam. Today, alhamdulillah, we have a team of 14 people. Our primary product is a subscription-based children's book series. Every month, families receive a new book delivered directly in their home, uh, and it is the product of all the research that we've done. Our work only exists through support from people like you, uh, and my humble request is do check it out. We have a uh, stall in the bazaar downstairs, check us out. And we also have a uh, link over here uh, for your benefit as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.